I'd like to thank the previous speakers as well, and particularly how, how Jillian's talk about using design thinking and problem solving for sustainability and Nan's discussion of a self-sustaining economy work towards exactly the kind of concept that we have. And it's, a, it's the story of a opportunity, but it has to begin with the description of a problem. If I say bee, most of us are gonna flash on a honeybee. This actually isn't a honeybee. The coloring's right, it's fuzzy, but it's bigger. It's hard to tell from the picture, it's broader. It's actually a bumblebee. So there are three parts to the bumblebee body, the head, the thorax, where the wings attach, and that big rear section they call the abdomen. An adult female like this one, there are six segments of the abdomen that have characteristic colorizations that allow you to tell which species of bumblebee you're looking at. So this, with the typical black and yellow bee coloring, is Bombus fervidus. Here's a different one. This is by far and away the most common bumblebee you'll see in this region. Bombus impatiens, with an S like the flower, has one yellow, five blacks. Here's another. Has three colors, one yellow, two orange, Another yellow, two black, cool looking. Three colors, so therefore Bombus ternarius. These are three of the 17 bumblebee species we have in this region. Those of you who are seniors at the university, born maybe around 1995 or 96, when you were born we had all 17 species. And now we're down to 10. And of those seven that are endangered, four are gone. They're gone. It doesn't matter what you build for habitat. They're not coming back. There's an ordinary rate of species loss that would suggest if we lost the first bumblebee species when you were born in 1995, we wouldn't expect to lose the fourth species into the year 3,400. And now we've lost four species in the time that you've gone through your senior year in college. That's not apple trees. It's not cherries. It's California, almond trees. The almond groves of California, there's 900,000 acres of almonds in California. As beautiful as that looks with the row upon row of blossoming trees, you can imagine coming back later in a month, it'll be just leaves. Leaves with grass growing between them. Nothing to sustain the native pollinators. And so, we're trucking in bees. Most people have heard about the water cost of almonds, how it takes almost 2,000 gallons of water to deliver a pound of almonds. There's a second cost, which is on our honeybees. Two of those boxes in a beehive that make a hive, those have about 30 to 50,000 bees in it. You can put six of them on a pallet, stack them three high. You need two hives per acre. That's 1.8 million hives. You can put about 400 of them on a semi-truck. That means 5,000 semi-trucks with 20 million bees each going across the country, spending a few weeks in California, and then going back around the country where they came from. A couple problems with that. There's only about 3 million hives in the country. 2016, 46% of the hives didn't make it through the winter. I can tell you as a beekeeper, this was a tough winter. We won't know quite how tough until spring arrives. But the way that bees have been beleaguered by habitat loss and pesticides, it's even worse when you look at this management practice because if you were a bee disease and you wanted to design a way of getting around, you'd bring all the bees to one part of the country for a few weeks and then distribute them back around the country. This cute little fella is about the size of a grain of rice, the Molipina bee. It's the principal pollinator for vanilla beans. Vanilla, it's an orchid, it grows on a vine, it blooms for just one day a year, looks like a daffodil, only more passionate. <laughs> These bees live in hollowed out trees and the deforestation in equatorial Central America has led to such a decline in the Molipina bee that almost all the vanilla in the world is hand pollinated. It happens that if you get there on that one day that that bloom is ready 
and slit it just so and take the anther which holds the male pollen and press it down onto the ovary, you'll get a vanilla bean. So it's possible, but a consequence of that is vanilla is the second most expensive spice in the world. These are people in southwest China pollinating a pear by hand. They started this practice in the 1980s to preserve a pear from cross-pollination by insects, but only in the last decade they realized they don't get fruit set without pollinating by hand. There's only some fruits, vegetables, nuts, and berries that you can pollinate by hand. It's very difficult to get a pollen grain into the ovule. If you cut an apple in half and you see those six seeds, that means each ovule got a pollen grain. It's very hard to do. Here's a West African proverb. Until the lion learns how to write, every story will glorify the hunter. For the next few minutes, I'd like us to try and take a perspective that's not the human perspective and see the world not from the point of view of the hunter or the lion, but to see the world from the perspective of those animals that don't have a spinal column and a bony skeleton that we call the invertebrates. Because of the known animal species on Earth, 95% of them are invertebrates. But the vertebrates control the media. So if the invertebrates were able to learn to write and tell a story that glorifies them, they would choose a moment about 140 million years ago. And what happened in that moment for the first time is that a tree or shrub that was used to spread against pollen on the wind in hopes of finding an ovary was visited by an invertebrate, probably a winged insect. And that insect took some of the pollen on its body and brought it across to the, a nearby plant. And we had the first pollinator. That first blossom, that first plant structure where that occurred, probably had no color or shape or scent. Maybe it had a, a resin, a prototype of the early nectars that attracted that pollinator. But over the next 100 million years, there were countless strategies of blossoms to attract creatures in order to interact with them and bring the pollen from plant to plant. And it's interesting that our paths diverged vertebrates and invertebrates 500 million years ago. When life was still in the oceans, the vertebrates went one direction, the invertebrates went another direction. It's interesting because these blossoms are so expressive to us. And we have a $30 billion cut flower industry and a $32 billion perfume industry, much of it built around human pair bonding. And there's more beauty here than even meets the human eye because while we see in the red, blue, green color spectrum, the invertebrates can see in the ultraviolet color spectrum. And so for us, this plain looking dandelion to a pollinator looks like that. And they're drawn to the regions of the plant where the most resin or nectar and pollen is. And it's interesting once we begin to see the world from the perspective of a pollinator because this verdant cornfield in Weybridge, Vermont, to a pollinator looks like that. Corn's wind pollinated. There's nothing there for them. And so is this. If the title of that first story that the pollinators would tell is the power of mutualism and how the interdependence between plants and animals led to an expansion of the number of species on our planet, including fruits and vegetables and blossoms that make the life we know it. That's kind of a long title. If there's a second story they would choose, it'd have a nice short title. And the title of that story would be The Century of the Expanding Human Footprint, because the invertebrates were around to see when two million years ago, the first rough habitations for human beings occurred in West Africa, not far from the site of our proverb about the hunter and the lion. They'd have seen those rough structures multiply and spread across the habitats of our earth, coalescing into cities, structures that crowded out all other organisms. 
They would see in the year 1800 when we reached 1 billion people. And the year 1930, when we reached 2 billion people. It took millions of years to make the first billion humans, 130 years to make the second. And now, in the century of the expanding human footprint, we make a billion people every 12 and a half years. And you folks were born into a complex time, and I'm sorry about that. It's human nature to think the time we live in is special, but also somehow ordinary. From the inverted perspective, since they've been here 500 million years, or 5 million centuries, which is the same thing, this century stands out. My parents' generation was the first to see the Earth's population double in their lifetime. If I live long enough, I'll see the population triple. So you gotta salute the renewable energy sector for, for getting it, for making the connection between energy consumption and the sustainability of life on our planet. That's a part of the big picture, but that's not the entirety of the big picture of humans' encroachment on the Earth's surface. And note that the growth is not going to be symmetric, that there will be 8.5 billion people in 2050 by the time you're ready for your children to matriculate in university living in the least and less developed countries. Ten and a half billion people is going to mean more cropland, which is monoculture, and more structures and more of this. This is turf grass, or lawn. This is the number one crop in America, more than all the corn, soybeans, fruit trees, and almond trees combined, is turf grass. And lawn has language. Lawn says, I'm a major university. This is a nation's capital. That's my second home in Vermont, across the expanse of lawn. In light of the expanding human footprint and the decline in species of those keystone pollinators, every place we see lawn, we should be asking why. If lawn is not the problem, I'd like to persuade you that it's an opportunity space. So we began in solar fields in 2015. Some very forward-minded developers of solar fields engaged us to plant the habitat for pollinators underneath and around the solar fields. What that means is planting a diversity of plants to support a diversity of pollinators. This is actually the, the plan for a uh, hedge that was to screen a field in Panton, Vermont. It's trees and shrubs, but the green bars are the bloom time. You're designing something like a slow motion fireworks display, so there's a continuous succession of bloom throughout the season to sustain them. But you also have to think about their shelter, and for the butterflies, of course, their larval host needs. This monarch caterpillar started as an egg that was pl placed there by a monarch butterfly and then grew by feeding on the milkweed, which it needs. And then, this is actually a different solar field and a different monarch, this is a field in Burlington, then became a monarch butterfly. How do we know that it works? We actually survey for plant diversity and abundance and survey for the number of unique pollinator encounters. So that first wheel field we planted in 2015, we walk a 400 foot row and for 15 minutes we count unique pollinator encounters. If a swallowtail comes across and then we see it again, that's not two, that's one. The first field we planted just south of Middlebury, Vermont in 2015 on August 2nd, 11 a.m. 15 minutes, there were 37 unique pollinator encounters in 15 minutes. That's actually not bad. A lot of these old farm fields are almost biologically dead. You'll see only six or seven pollinators in a 15 minute period. One year later, after insulation, there were 174 pollinator encounters in the same 15 minutes, same day, same date, same windless, sunny kind of day. Which means if they are there, if the pollinators are there and you build a sustaining habitat for them, they will expand in number. And that's the opportunity. So how do we get this done? Think about your home, your dorm room, 
the building that's home back in your hometown, that thing that you inhabit that shelters you, that has a footprint, a physical footprint. This is the space that I occupy that excludes other organisms. What if we were to generate a sensibility where that space that we occupy is something we could also take the same square footage and go somewhere where there is grass or turf and create a pollinator habitat? And not only our homes, what about the office buildings? What about the gathering spaces like this? What about the shops in town? We go into towns and ask the schools, do you have an acre of land that you're sick of mowing? And they say yes. We go to the shops and business and says, will you take your 1,200 square foot of bookshop and sustain a pollinator population of 1,200 square feet over in the school? And they say yes. And that's how you can grow the pollinator footprint. So that as we grow another 3 billion real estate consumers, they can actually become part of the solution and we can work towards a more sustainable planet. That opportunity exists right now. 20 years from now, as we continue to lose pollinators, I can't say, but I can tell you that I've observed it and the most rewarding thing is to see a field that was dead now alive with pollinators. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you.